All right, I'm gonna share with you one of the secrets of an amazing essay. Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm a teacher and author, and this is English Nerd. So I've talked in a lot of different videos about writing thesis statements, developing body paragraphs, using evidence, all of that. You can just search my channel. It's all there. But one element that I haven't talked about a ton that really sets apart an incredible essay, an incredible argument from one that is much weaker is prolepsis. Prolepsis is just a fancy word for um, acknowledging and anticipating opposing arguments. This is actually something that more people should do just in real life, acknowledging the reality of opposing arguments instead of simply cherry picking information that aligns with your own views. We all have this tendency from time to time to, to do it, whether it's in a literary uh, argument kind of sense, in a scientific kind of sense in a political kind of sense. We we have this confirmation bias where we just pay attention to those things that support our own theories. Now, as people and as writers who are crafting literary analysis arguments, we need to acknowledge the other side of the argument. That doesn't mean conceding that you do not have a strong argument. If you end up feeling that way, then change your argument, change your views. That is uh, the, one of the marks of a thoughtful person is that they are not so married to their theories that they're unable to change in the face of compelling evidence. So all this to say, if you know a work really well, then you should understand that there is another way to look at the story. If there is only one way to look at it and there's no opposing view that's possible, then maybe your, your argument is not as compelling as it should be because it's not that debatable. It's just something that is true about the story. But let's take a concrete example so I can show you how prolepsis can actually strengthen your essay. So for argument's sake, we're going to take King Henry V by William Shakespeare. Yes, this book is teeny tiny. I have a few um, complete works of Shakespeare, but those were humongous. This is the only <laughs> uh, Henry V by itself that I have. So here we go, Henry V. Um, so Henry V is, as you, if you, you know if you've read it, is the story of Hal, who was kind of a ne'er-do-well hanging out with butterflies and things like that in... Henry IV parts one and two, and now he is this young king who is eager to prove himself as the leader of his country. And as part of that endeavor, he goes to France to reclaim, in his mind, reclaim land that rightly belongs to the English crown instead of to the French. So a lot of the story is the campaign through France as the English troops go on. Um, a, a, one of my favorite speeches of all time, the we few, we happy few, we band of brothers speech is in this play. So you, the writer, are going to make the case that this story is fundamentally anti-war, not pro-war. Um, if you look at the Hollow Crown series where Tom Hiddleston played uh, King Henry V, this was his take on the story, which is, which is a unique take. Um, that it's fundamentally anti-war because of what we see as the fallout, as, you know, what did they really gain through all this, you know, just these different pieces of evidence throughout the story um, kind of informed uh, the, the filmmaker's view. Now, if you've read this story, there is a strong case to make in the opposite direction, that this is uh, appallingly pro. So we have not only the We Few, We Band of Brothers, We Few, We Happy Few, We Band of Brothers speech, but we have Once More Into the Breach. We have the way that Henry V, King Henry, is proving himself is through these battles and through regaining, regaining, I don't know if that's legitimate, but regaining this land, proving himself not only as a king, but as a warrior. So if you are writing an essay in which you are concurring with the filmmakers that this is, yes, a complex, but ultimately anti-war play, then you have to acknowledge that opposing viewpoint that other people are going to point out passages, they're going to point out um, alternate arguments 
that suggest the opposite. There are a few places where you can put some of those acknowledgements. Um, in one formulation of a good thesis statement, that, that overall statement of what your argument is going to be about at the beginning of your essay, some people suggest that you begin with a prolepsis, although much of the action of Henry V takes place on the battlefield, you know, so you're kind of, you're conceding a little bit, you're going to, you're showing that you're going to acknowledge some of those opposing arguments. This play is still fundamentally anti-war, um, or whatever it is you want to say. So you can put it in the thesis statement, you don't have to. Um, my recommendation is to thread it through the body paragraphs where those those objections would reasonably come up if you were actually presenting this to a group of other people who are familiar with the play. Um, if you are unfamiliar with the play and you're only looking for those things that support your argument, it's going to show. And so by acknowledging, anticipating, and addressing opposing viewpoints and saying, okay, maybe here's, here's, where, a, a, here's where the opposing arguments are legitimate, and here's where they fall short, you're going to strengthen your own argument because it shows that you've thought about those other points of view. You've taken them into consideration. You didn't just arbitrarily choose a theory and then pull evidence to support that, but instead you can actually hold your own if somebody who is familiar with the work were to come to you and, and um, challenge you. So this um, part of acknowledging those objections is making sure that your your evidence for your own viewpoint is strong enough to actually uh, go against those opposing arguments, to stand up against those things. So you have to do more than just retell the story in order to make your point. You really need to get into the nitty gritty of the way something is phrased or the detail so that people who also know the story and can point to the plot points um, have to acknowledge that the details and the way that you craft your argument um, really is the, the stronger way to look at the story. So yeah, start using prolepsis, weave it in just a little bit. Um, the last note that I'll leave you with here is something that I sometimes see with my students um, in say a five paragraph essay where you have intro, three body paragraphs, conclusion. Sometimes what I'll see is students will start with their strongest point, they'll go to their second strongest point, and then they'll acknowledge objections in the third paragraph because that's the way that they thought through their own argument. They thought, oh, okay, this is a strong argument because of this. Uh, I need another point. Okay, so here's another point. Oh, but let's, you know, if I need to include prolepsis, let's consider that. If you end on prolepsis, chances are it's going to undermine your overall argument, it's better, I would recommend, to weave it throughout those body paragraphs and leave all the body paragraphs as strong arguments for your own um, point of view, your own argument, without um, just leaving some opposing argument out there at the very end without really addressing it. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about prolepsis, please do put those in the comments below. I hope this was helpful for you. This one thing, often sets apart um, amateur or younger, kind of less developed essay writing of literary analysis with something that is much more compelling and sophisticated. So yeah, make sure to like this video if you like it. Um, subscribe to English Nerd for more English nerdy goodness, and I will see you next week. Bye!